William already had our opening prayer, so um, we'll just begin. Uh, Brother William said something, and I'm not disagreeing with him. He would, I agree with the point he made, but it's something about even if one group could be in a church where truth is being presented. And right now, my wife and I are attending when we're home, which isn't very often, a little congregation where, as far as we can tell, Truth is presented every Sabbath, and it's kind of discouraging. Um, Sister White says in early writings, page 63, there are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. Um, the blessing is really to be in a congregation that's presenting present truth, and I know William wasn't making that point. I'm just using that as a segue, is that what they say? Because during the, the interim we had a discussion about what is the present truth message, so it was sort of on my mind. Um, I think you need to crit critically assess what I'm sharing, you need to test it by the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. Um, it's either truth or error, or a mixture of both, and you don't want anything but truth, present truth. You have the responsibility to test what you're hearing, and one of the claims that I'm making is that there is a specific present truth message for every generation. And here in this final generation, I'm suggesting that what we're presenting is the present truth testing message for Seventh-day Adventism at the end of the world. Um, I'm not trying to do any kind of self-exaltation or lifting up in that. I'm trying to forewarn you that what we're teaching, if it's correct, is of such a serious nature that you have to understand it correctly. You have to test it. It's false. It's false. Reject it, but you have to test it. Um, the quote I want to put into the, the study here is from Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 7 and 8. It says, Revelation is a sealed book, but it's also an open book. It records marvelous events that are take place are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. The teachings of the book are definite, not mystical and unintelligible. In it, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Um, some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. Now, of course, you could, you could consider this quote much better if you had it right in front of you, you to read, but there are at least three, probably many that I don't recognize, but three points in this passage that seem significant to me. Um, the one is, is that some prophecies in the Bible have been repeated several times. And then she also adds that when the Lord repeats something, it means he's putting an extra special emphasis on it. That's my paraphrase. She says, some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. So Amen. I would like to point out to you um, one other thought. The sentence that precedes that says, in speaking of the book of Revelation, in it, the book of Revelation, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Um, last night we were having a discussion with a brother about a well-known um, influence in the Latin world in Adventism, one of the most well-known pastors that is among many in Adventism that teach that, this, that the eight heads of Revelation 17 are popes. Five popes that have fallen, one pope that is, and one is yet to come, and the eighth is of the seven. And one of my first arguments to that, there are many arguments to that, because that is just total error. But my first argument is, show me the eight popes in the book of Daniel, because Sister White says, in the book of Revelation, the same line of prophecy that is in the book of Daniel is taken up. So where are the popes in the book of Daniel? Not there. Um, but what we want to focus on is that the Lord doesn't repeat things that are of no small consequence. And when it comes to Bible prophecy, there is a combination that is repeated over and over and over again. And it comes in a simple form, it comes in a complex form. It's the 3 1 combination, and it's representing the three angels' messages that came into history in the Millerite time period, followed by the fourth angel at the end of the world. The fourth angel being the angel of Revelation 18, 
which is Adventist, we understand, is the loud cry of the third angel's message. We understand that that is the latter rain. We call it the fourth angel. There's actually two angels there, right? Right? Amen? If you, if you understand there's two angels and the fourth angel, say amen. 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 Okay. In verse 1 through 3, an eight mighty angel comes down out of heaven and the earth is lightened with his glory. And then verse, says, verse 4 says, and I heard another voice. There's two angels there. But in any case, that combination, the three-one combination, is identifying the three angels' messages that came into history in the Millerite time period, ultimately to be followed by the fourth angel's message. This combination you see running throughout the scriptures over and over again. When you see a prophecy in the scriptures that is illustrating the end of the world, many, many times you will see the three-one combination. We know that Noah is an illustration of the end of the world, and Noah and his three sons got up on the ark. In Numbers 22, just before the children of Israel were to enter the promised land, King Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel. He pronounced three blessings instead of three curses. This disappointed King Balak, and I'm saying disappointed for a purposeful reason. After the clear way mark, you will see a disappointment illustrated. We're going to deal with that as we proceed. But after Balaam's three blessings, before he went home, he pronounced the fourth blessing. There are, I forget now, usually I know, there's at least 11 places where Sister White, a different place, identifies Nebuchadnezzar's testing image in Daniel chapter 3 as symbolic of the Sunday law test. And if you've ever wondered why Daniel wasn't in Daniel chapter 3, it's because he would have thrown off the combination. Because the test of Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel 3 is a Sunday law test, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come to the Sunday law test, and then when King Nebuchadnezzar finds out that his three best men didn't bow down to the testing image, he's disappointed, but he throws them into the fire furnace anyway, and a fourth appears with them. Uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, which is an illustration of the end of the world, Jesus took three disciples with him. Over and over again, in passages of the scriptures where the end of the world is illustrated, such as the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham was visited by not four, not two, but by three heavenly visitors, and the three-one combination is illustrating that that particular prophetic passage has some direct relevance to Adventism. And by Adventism, I mean the beginning of Adventism in the Millerite movement and the end of Adventism when the 144,000 are raised up. We know as Seventh-day Adventists from the writings of Sister White that we are almost at the point in time when every earthly support is going to be cut off. And that condition that we're about to enter into, if we're faithful, is illustrated in the book of Job. And in the book of Job, he had two friends or four friends that come into that scenario and deal with him. There's three friends. The three-one combination is repeated over and over again in the scriptures to, to put a mark upon the history that we are part of, the beginning and the end of Adventism. Concerning the fact that, that Christ does not repeat things that are of no great consequence, the introduction to the book of Revelation is chapter 1, and there isn't... I had a brother in the break telling me, and I looked for him, I think he didn't stick around. I did everything I could to try to get him to stick around. No, he doesn't do that. But he, he, uh, he made a point that he was, he was emphasizing it, and I agree with him, that every letter, not just every word, but every letter in the Bible, it has to do with our salvation. And I don't have a problem with putting that kind of emphasis on it. But when it comes to the book of Revelation, chapter 1 is the, the introduction, and it's from Revelation chapter 1 that you get your point of reference to unravel the prophecies in the book of Revelation. And when Christ is identifying himself in chapter 1 of Revelation, every word in there means something. Every truth has a purpose that has been designed by Christ in order to allow the student of prophecy to understand the books and the Revelation. And the one characteristic in the book of Revelation that Christ identifies of himself more than any other is that he's the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And there is no other characteristic in Revelation chapter 1 that comes close to being mentioned and identified as many times as that. And they tell us that two out of three words in the book of Revelation find their, their beginning point in the rest of the Bible. In fact, Sister White has a statement in the Acts of the Apostles, page 585, which says, In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. 
Two out of three words in the book of Revelation have their source in the rest of the Bible. And if you're going to understand what it means that Christ is the beginning and the ending, I would point you to Isaiah chapter 40 and onward. From Isaiah chapter 40 to the end of the book of Isaiah, you will see him referring over and over again to the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And when you bring those truths together, the, one of the primary teachings that is connected with those symbols is that Jesus is the God that illustrates the end of a thing with the beginning of a thing. And this is easy to see. It is his signature, so to speak. I'll give you a couple examples of this. Um, we are still dealing with the three one combination. But the 1260 the year time prophecy of the papacy ruling the world begins in 538. What historical event marks the beginning of the 1260 year rule? It's when the last ruler of the Goths is driven out of the city of Rome. That's what starts the 1260 years. Isn't that correct? If it's correct, say amen. 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 It is correct. When the, the ruler of the Goths fled the cities of the city of Rome, the 1260 year time period began. And it ended when the ruler, the Pope, that was ruling from the city of Rome, was taken out of the city of Rome. At the beginning of the prophecy, you see a ruler taken out of the city of Rome, the end of the prophecy, you see the ruler taken out of the city of Rome. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. Um, on the testimony of two or three, I think it's established. The time prophecy that is foundational to Adventism that we are very unfamiliar with anymore is the time prophecy in Revelation 9, verse 14 and 15, that begins on July 27, 1449, and goes for 391 years and 15 days. and concludes on August 11th, 1840. <clears throat> and what begins this time prophecy is there's a king, or there's a, a man that is supposed to inherit the throne, but at that time the four great powers of the Turks were so strong that this king refused to take the throne until he received permission from these four great powers in Turkey. And if you have to ask permission to be the king, you're no longer the king. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of this prophecy is when a king surrenders his national sovereignty to four great powers. That's the beginning of the 391-year, 15-day time prophecy. And it's in agreement with the pioneer understanding of that time prophecy. This is my interpretation. This is how they'll teach it, too, if you're not familiar with it. And the end of that time prophecy is when the last ruler of Turkey no longer had any strength left. And he surrenders his national sovereignty to the four great European powers. At the beginning of the time prophecy, you have a king surrendering his national sovereignty to four powers. And it ends when a king surrenders his national sovereignty to four powers. The beginning of the prophecy illustrates the end, because Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. He's the first and the last. He's the Alpha and Omega. Another illustration of this, there's several, but all we need is two or three, according to the Bible, upon the testimony of two or three things established. We've mentioned this earlier, but what begins the 2300-year prophecy is the third decree. And the third decree begins, and 2300 years later, it ends on the third message. Begins on the third decree, ends on the third message, and... How many, in this history of the decrees, and if you're familiar with this material, please don't answer. This is for those of you here that aren't familiar with this sort of presentation. I want to ask a question that allows you to think it through a little bit. In this history of rebuilding Jerusalem when they came out of Babylon, how many decrees are there? Three or four? Okay, there are five. But we wanted to get you to think about it. The fourth decree was the decree of Nehemiah when he came back and finished the work. Remember the streets and the walls were going to be built in troublous times and Nehemiah is the one the Lord used to finish the work. And before Nehemiah came back, he received a decree from the king. So you see in this beginning history of the 2300 days, you see the three-one combination. Three decrees followed by a fourth. And it's illustrating the end of this time prophecy. Three messages followed by the fourth this message. And there's always a distinct break between the third and the fourth. That's why it's a three-one combination. And certainly, there's been a distinct break in Advent history. Sister White, shortly after 1844, said we could have been in heaven ere this. 
that it's been what? 168 years, is that right? And we're still here. So this 3-1 combination, when you see it with Noah and his three sons, or with Abraham and the three heavenly visitors, it's a very simple expression of this combination. But in the illustrations like the 2300 days is where you will get complex information about the 3-1 combination. And we're going to consider that from this point onward in connection with what we started with last night, or the first presentation this morning from Great Controversy 343, where Sister White says that the reformatory movements of the past parallel the important movements of our day and age. And I want to read that again, just to remind us. Great Controversy 343. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. And what we're going to begin with now is to try to put look at the it's a reformatory movement of the Millerite history that we're saying begins at the time of the end of 1798 when the book of Daniel is unsealed and reaches its conclusion on October 22, 1844. But it can't be separated from the fact that this history also includes the fourth angel's message down at the end of the world. We're going to deal with that later. But right now we're looking at the history of 1798 to 1844 and those dates Remember, our book are their bookends. This is when the first 25, 20 time prophecy concluded. This is when the second concluded. There is no accidents if you had time to look closely at the 25, 20. There are many just really significant revelations connected with that where you see that it's, it is not an accident. So if you go with me to Daniel 12, we'll start with the time of the end because there are things about the time of the end that aren't widely understood in Adventism. Daniel 12, verse 4. It says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. This phrase, run to and fro, is a Hebrew phrase representing a running to and fro in God's word. I mean, I'm not going to argue that there was an in increase of you know, industrial understanding and inventions from 1798 onward, I think that's a secondary fulfillment of this, but the primary fulfilling of verse 4, fulfillment of verse 4, is the, the understanding of the increase of knowledge that took place in 1798. Those that were running to and fro are the students of prophecy at that time, and this here, this dot here, is representing an increase of knowledge, okay? 1798, when the book of Daniel is unsealed, it's an increase of knowledge. It's not just there's a, there's a truth revealed, there's an escalating unfolding of prophecy. Now, what we read in Great Controversy, page 343, says that every reformatory movement is the same. God's dealing with men is ever, ever the same. So we're going to show you as we proceed that each one of the reformatory movements in history, they all have a time in the end. And, and the time of the end has, when you look at it from this point of view, what, what the waymark of the time of the end is in these reformatory movements, it has certain characteristics. One of the characteristics is this. What marks the time of the end is a fulfillment of a prophecy. And the fulfillment of the prophecy here in 1798 is the prophecy of the papacy ruling the world for 1260 years. Okay, so 1798 is not simply the time of the end. In 1798, the papacy received a deadly wound. There was a prophecy identifying that at the end of 1,200 years, the papacy would receive a deadly wound. Now, there's, there's an added, there's something connected to this. So don't lose the train of thought here. When that prophecy is fulfilled, the fulfillment of this prophecy sheds light upon the upcoming epic of sacred history. We have always understood in Adventism 
correctly understood, if you go to Daniel 7, if you're in Daniel 12, <clears throat> that in, look at verse 25 of Daniel 7. It says that he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Who's under discussion? The papacy. And they shall be given into his hands. The saints shall be given into his hands until the time to the time and the divide of time. The papacy is going to rule the world and persecute the saints until 1798, right? That's what this verse is saying. And then notice the next verse. But the judgment shall set. In Adventism, we have always correctly understood that the judgment cannot take place until after the papacy receives the deadly wound. So, what marks the time of the end in 1798 is a fulfillment of a prophecy. The papacy receives a deadly wound. But once the papacy receives a deadly wound, then we know that the, the next thing that happens in history is the judgment. The fulfillment of this prophecy, the papacy's deadly wound, identifies that the next epic of sacred history is about to take place. And that epic is that William Miller is going to be raised up to, to announce the beginning of the judgment. Okay, you follow the logic there. Yeah. Okay. So at the time in the end, the book of Daniel is unsealed, and you, some of you weren't here last night. Okay, so you can you can get a hold of the presentation last night that's been recorded. We had we had some references to back up what I'm going to say here very briefly. In Revelation chapter 5, John sees God the Father sitting upon the throne with the book that sealed with seven seals. That book is the Bible. So the White says so. And no man can open that book that sealed with seven seals. And because no man can open it, John weeps much. It's important to keep that in the back of your mind that John wept much. And as soon as John weeps much, then the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is Christ, who has prevailed, he begins to open the book that sealed the seven seals. And then we know chapter 6 and onward, Jesus is opening the seven seals of Revelation. And we know that each of these seals are operating upon the principle of repeat and enlarge. Or before you get to chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, you have chapters 2 and 3, and you have the seven churches of Revelation. And the seven churches of Revelation give the history of the Christian church until our day and age, until the end of the world. And when the seals are being opened, this is repeating that history and enlarging upon it. And so, when Jesus begins, the line of the tribe of Judah, to unseal these seals, in chapters 5 and 6 of Revelation and onward, what he's doing, remember, the same line of prophecy that's taken up in the book of Revelation is in the book of Daniel. When the Lion of the tribe of Judah is unsealing the Bible, because that's what it is, in Revelation 5 and 6, he's unsealing the book of Daniel in 1798. And there's suddenly an increase of knowledge, and sure enough, the Millerites came to understand the seals and the trumpets and the churches of Revelation because the Lion of the tribe of Judah unsealed it to them. As the increase of knowledge proceeds, there comes a time where the message of that time period will be formalized. If you can't read this in the back, it says <coughs> message formalized. In 1833, the Lord raises up William Miller to put the message of that hour into a package that is destined to test that generation. And we read that last night and referred to it this morning. Early writings, page 259. Those people that did not receive the first angel's message we're not in the testing process when the second angel's message arrived, and the first angel's message was the message that was brought by William Miller. We follow these waymarks so far. Every reformatory movement is the same. They all begin with the time of the end. The time of the end is a fulfillment of a prophecy, and when that prophecy is fulfilled, it will shed light upon the upcoming history as the increase of knowledge takes place, when this prophetic truth is unsealed, there will be students of prophecy that are running to and fro in God's prophetic word. They are understanding the un increasing light, and then there comes a point in time where the message for that particular history is formalized. It's put into a package, and the Lord used William Miller to do so. 
His message went through history for a period of time, roughly seven years. And then there comes a point in time when the message is empowered. And when the message is empowered, you can see the first angel's message empowered in Revelation chapter 10. Christ comes down out of heaven with the book of Daniel open in his hand. And uh, the message progresses once it's empowered. And Sister White says in Great Controversy 611, in 1840, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. That's when, why when Christ comes down in Revelation 10 and puts his foot upon the land and on the sea, he's identifying a worldwide message. The next way mark in these histories, brothers and sisters, you will see the activities of the enemies of that particular time. And what, what marks the second angel's message, what marks the, the second primary way mark in this history, is when the organized churches began to close their door on the Millerites. That was the arrival of the second angel's message. In Testimonies, Volume 1, page, one, page 21, Sister White says it was June of 1842. When you get to the this way mark here, we're saying that this is the first angel's message. This is the second. And this is the third. The way Mark that lines up with this second angel's message is identifying the activities of the enemies in that time period. The Protestant churches I am calling the enemies. This message proceeds through history, and there's some of you that are getting kind of heavy-eyed there, and I don't know that you want to do that. I know that this is the most difficult presentation probably after lunch, but hang, hang on with this for a short period of time. This message goes through history for a period of time until it's in power. And it's empowered <coughs> at the Midnight Cry at a, at a camp meeting in Exeter, New Hampshire. Mm. New York. New, what was that? New York. New York, okay. Exeter. August 12th to 17th, the second angel's message is empowered, and in roughly two months, the Midnight Cry is carried across the United States in a time period when there's no cars or airplanes or telephones or telegraph or emails. Um, uh, the point being, the telegram was invented in '44. <laughs> yeah, but the point being is that it was a mighty manifestation of the power of God that to carry that message across the United States in two months was a manifestation of the power of God. And the reason that I'm saying that is that we're we're going to be identifying the characteristics of these waymarks, and one of the characteristics of this second message is it reaches a point where it's empowered, and when it's empowered, it is a manifestation of the power of God. And this manifestation of the power of God concludes, it climaxes, it reaches its conclusion when the third waymark arrives. And uh, associated with the third waymark, you will see judgment illustrated. In the Millerite time period, judgment began. Um, and then you will find in these waymarks, as you go through the 3-1 combination, that it's followed by a disappointment. Uh, King Balak was disappointed with uh, Balaam's three blessings. And, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was disappointed that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't bow down. And we'll show you some other disappointments. Mm -hmm. and this is an important point. After the disappointment, God's people are given a work to do. Mm -hmm. They're always given a work to do. And the, the, work, the work that we were given to do, ultimately we quit doing. Mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventist Church is no longer doing the work it was raised up to do. I say that not because I'm criticizing the church, because, but because this is illustrated in every one of these reform movements. Always happens. There's nothing new under the sun. God has not changed. His dealings with men are ever the same. So this is the end. This history here is the end of the 2300-year prophecy. The beginning of the 2300-year prophecy. This, this history begins with the captivity of the Christian church in spiritual Babylon, when the papacy ruled the world for twenty for 1260 years, this history, the history of the three decrees, the history of God's people coming out of Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem, it begins with the captivity of Israel and Babylon. So it's preceded by a captivity. And what I'm saying is that there will always be a prophecy that's fulfilled that marks the time of the end. And in this history, and, and the fulfillment of that prophecy will cast light upon the upcoming 
prophetic history. In this history, the coming out of Babylon, what prophecy do you think marks the time of the end? For that history. It's the 70 years of Jeremiah. And the 70 years of Jeremiah doesn't, doesn't end in 457. It ends long before that. The 70 year prophecy of Jeremiah 25, 12. If you look closely at it, it begins when Jerusalem is destroyed and 70 years later, Babylon is taken down. Did you know that? It was 70 years between the destruction of Jerusalem and the bringing down of Babylon, and that's Jeremiah's prophecy. So what I'm saying is, is when Babylon comes down, the fulfillment of that prophecy, the children of Israel are going to come out of Babylon. Babylon's down, now it's time for them to return to build Jerusalem. I'm saying that with the fulfillment of Jeremiah's 70 years, Babylon's removed, the next epic of sacred history is to come out of Babylon, it's fallen, and rebuild Jerusalem. At that point in time, you should see prophetic light that's unsealed, and you should see students of prophecy understanding the increase of knowledge as they run to and fro in God's Word. And where do we see the students of prophecy understanding the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy as a marker for being time to return to Jerusalem? If you turn to Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, it says this. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seeds of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the book the numbers of the years, the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seven years in the desolations of Jerusalem. That's Daniel 9, verse 1 and 2. And Daniel immediately goes into his prayer. And what is his prayer about? About allowing the Lord's people to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. Daniel here represents the students of prophecy that have understood the time of the end and began to understand the increase of knowledge for that generation. And the knowledge for that generation was that it's time to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild it. Okay? The next thing in the reformatory movement is that you're going to have to see the message formalized. The Lord is going to have to use someone to formalize the message of that hour, and the message of that hour is um, the message to go back to Jerusalem and build it again. And let me read you a couple of quotes from Sister White. We already mentioned this earlier today, but I was going pretty fast. The, the person that recognizes from God's word the message of the hour is Cyrus. And I have the quote I want to read here. This is from Prophets and Kings 557. And now, just at the time God had said he would cause his temple at Jerusalem to be rebuilt, rebuilt, he moved upon Cyrus as his agent to discern the prophecies concerning himself, with which Daniel was so familiar, and to grant the Jewish people their liberty. Cyrus came to understand, with the increase of knowledge, that it was time to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And he was going to be the, the agent that made this happen by passing the first decree. And he sort of backslid in that commitment. And Prophets and Kings 571 says this. While Satan was striving to influence the highest powers in the kings of Medo-Persia to show disfavor to God's people, angels worked in behalf of the exiles. The controversy was one in which all heaven was interested. Through the prophet Daniel, we are given a glimpse of this mighty struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. For three weeks, Gabriel wrestled with the powers of darkness, seeking to counteract the influence at work on the mind of Cyrus. 
And before the contest closed, Christ himself came to Gabriel's aid. And she quotes Daniel 10.13 and says, All that heaven could do in behalf of the people of God was done. The victory was finally gained. The forces of the enemy were held in check all the days of Cyrus and all the days of his son Cambyses, who reigned about seven and a half years. After Cyrus understood his role from God's word, as there was an increase of knowledge about this particular history, it was necessary for his message to be empowered, and when his message was empowered, Michael, a divine symbol, came down out of heaven in order to empower it, and the first angel's message was empowered. Now, one of the characteristics that I have not yet mentioned, that I'm going to put in the record here, is this first way mark in these different histories. It always has some type of worldwide aspect. In Great Controversy 611, later on this week, we will read that passage word for word. I'll just point forward to it at this time. In Great Controversy 611, Sister White says in 1840, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. Whereas she teaches, and the historians confirm that the second angel's message was fulfilled in the United States. The second angel's message was not fulfilled in the world, it was fulfilled in the United States. But the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. One of the characteristics of the first way, Mark, is that it is worldwide in its aspect. Turn with me, if you would, to Ezra chapter 1. It should be a very familiar book to every Seventh-day Adventist because it is definitely the foundation of Adventism. It marks the beginning of the 2300 years. In Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus say Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now what I want you to see here, brothers and sisters, is that Cyrus is saying that he's the king of all the earth, and that he's the ruler over all the kingdoms of the earth. When he makes his decree, it is worldwide. Whereas the following decrees by Darius and Artaxerxes, they make no claim to being worldwide. Whereas Cyrus, who proclaims the first decree, his decree is worldwide. He is the king of all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, I asked a trick question earlier, and by and large, reflect on the question, and the question was, how many decrees are there in this history? We're suggesting that the first decree is the decree of Cyrus, the second decree is the decree of Darius, Darius. the third decree is the decree of Artaxerxes, and then down here, the fourth decree is the decree of Nehemiah, but I said there were five decrees, all right? And I want to show you the fifth decree, and the reason the fifth decree is not acknowledged is these four decrees that we do acknowledge are decrees that contribute to building Jerusalem. But in this history, there is a decree that stops the work. And the characteristic of the second waymark is the activities of the enemy. So in, in the history of the second waymark, I want to show you that there is an activity of the enemies identified. And uh, in... Chapter 4, in between the first decree and the second decree, in chapter 4 of Ezra, um, in verse 21, you'll see a, a decree made by the king of the Zen ruling. Um, his name is Artaxerxes, and the, they call him Artaxerxes here in Ezra, but it is not the same Artaxerxes who gives the third decree. In fact, Sister White, when she comments on this king, calls him false, false Smyrtus, who's an imposter. But nevertheless, he was ruling during this time, and the enemies of the Jews attempted to stop the work, and they appealed to this king, saying, if you allow the Jews to continue to rebuild Jerusalem, they're going to be a thorn in their flesh, and you need to make them stop. And in verse 21, 
It says, Give you now commandment to cause these men to cease, and that this city be not builded until another commandment shall be given. And if you drop down to verse 24, you see the conclusion of this decree. It says, Then cease the work of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So in the history of the second decree, this is not the second decree. This is the false decree here that stops the work. You see the activities of the enemy. It's, it's from this, this stoppage of work that the Jews appeal to the next king, Darius, saying that Cyrus had given his permission to build, and Cyrus does a search. And sure enough, he finds or Darius does a search, and he finds Cyrus's decree. And in chapter 6, you see the second decree. And I'm, I'm passing over much information, um, because we have a lot of ground to cover. So you have the second decree arrives under Cyrus. And then in the third decree, um, in chapter 7, if you've ever wondered what's the prophetic justification, for beginning the 2300 prophecy on the third decree, the prophetic justification for starting the 2300 year prophecy on the third decree is that it was that decree that returned the national sovereignty to the Jews. The first two decrees contributed to building Jerusalem and the temple and the streets and the walls even in troublous times. But it's the third decree where national sovereignty is returned to them. And if you go to chapter 7 of Ezra, verse 25, uh, in 26, you'll see what I mean by national sovereignty. Verse 25 of chapter 7 says, And now, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, said magistrate and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not, and whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of thy king. Now notice, whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, Whosoever breaks a religious law or whosoever breaks a civil law. Okay, they're given their whole national sovereignty back here. Whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of thy king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or unto banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. In the third decree, the Jews are given the authority to punish criminals, both civil and religious, even unto death. They are allowed to judge in the third decree, their, their ability to judge is returned because one of the characteristics of the third way mark was the judgment illustrated. Now, after the third way mark, invariably, you're going to find a, an, um, a disappointment identified. And Ezra is the, the figure that's associated with the third decree. And in Prophets and Kings, page 612, it says, Ezra, Ezra had expected that a large number would return to Jerusalem, but the number who responded to the call was disappointingly small. After the third decree, you have the disappointment. After the third decree, the people are to finish the building of the streets and the walls. Why am I saying finish the building of the streets and the walls? Because... It's important to take note that the Bible and the spirit of prophecy both identify that before the third decree, before the third decree, the temple was finished. All right? The temple's finished before the third decree. And the reason that I'm making that point is when you have time, once you've, once you've set these lines of prophecy up and you've looked at them and you've recognized that the way marks, the characteristics are always identical, once you have that in your mind and you set it up, and you can go back into these histories and start gleaning important truths from them. And the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy and History teaches that when they had to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple and the streets and the walls, that before the third decree, the temple was completed. And if you remember what we looked at this morning, and I know it was new, new information for many, so maybe you didn't follow me. But... From 1798 until 1844, in 46 years, Christ raised his spiritual temple so the messenger of the covenant could suddenly come to his temple. The temple has to be erected before the third decree, and sure enough, the temple was finished. Not St. Jerusalem, the temple was finished before the third decree. Um, you can find this in Ezra 6.15. 
Um, but there is one other point that I want to add to this, and this is a point that is connected to one of the themes that we have been dealing with. I'm going back into the history of the first decree now, in chapter 3 of Ezra. Chapter 3 of Ezra, this is still the history of the first decree. This history right here, all right? And in verse... 10 of chapter 3 of Ezra, it says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, the king of Israel. And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they laid the... the the foundation of the house, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Point being this, William Miller is the messenger of the first angel's message. William Miller is the man that the Lord associates with and the man that the Lord used to establish the foundations of Adventism that are represented on those two charts over there. And those truths were established in this time period here. Right here. The foundation of Adventism was laid in the history here, 1840. It was parallel in the fact that the foundation of the temple was laid during the history of the first decree. And remember, I've, I've pointed out that, that in fulfillment of Revelation, or of Isaiah 58 12, one of the works that will be accomplished by the 144,000 is that they will raise up the foundations of many generations. And what we're doing right now is raising up to your attention the fact that in every reformatory movement there is a foundation that is laid, and it is always laid in the history of this first decree, this first message. It's important to understand that. Because the foundations in our time period come under attack. And one of the ways they come under attack is we no longer put much relevance on the work of William Miller, yet he's the one the Lord used to raise the foundation. So we need to be clear about what work he accomplished on the testimony of two or three a thing is established. If you and I understand conclusively that the work that William Miller accomplished in laying the foundation of Adventism is valid, then we're going to be prepared to withstand all the modern theologian arguments that are brought to bear suggesting that his reasoning was law. This, this is important information because if we maintain the foundational understandings of Adventism, we will have the key to unlock the message of revelation that is unfolding today. And there is one that's unfolding today. So the foundation is laid in the first, the history of the first decree. Then you see the activities of the enemies when there's a, the fifth decree, essentially, to stop the work in that entire history. Then the second decree the third decree, Ezra's disappointment, a work is given to ancient Israel to finish rebuilding Jerusalem. Did they do it? They did not do it. They quit doing the work. They said, remember the story. They started building their own homes, and the Lord had to raise up Nehemiah. That's the apostasy. There is a work given to them. Finish building the city. They started building their own homes. Maybe this is too severe of a, you know, identification of the fact that they start building their own homes instead of finishing Jerusalem. But then the Lord raises up Nehemiah, and Nehemiah secures the fourth decree, and he finishes this, the streets and walls. According to Daniel 9, he finishes the streets and walls in what? Troublous times. In troublous times. So one of the characteristics of this fourth message is troublous times. Mark that. For this reason, the troublous times is a subject of Bible prophecy. Um, in, Matt, in Luke 21, the troublous times are called the distress of nations. In Revelation 11, verse 18, it's called the angering of the nations. There is a power in Bible prophecy that is the angering of the nations that brings the troublous times, that brings the distress of nations. And the Millerites have already identified who that power is. It's represented on the chart. The power that brings the distress of nations is Islam. And Islam will be in end-time Bible prophecy in the time period of the fourth angel's message. 
has to be recognized because the fourth angel's message is going to take place in troublous times. In fact, we are all familiar with the quote that Bishop Sister White says we will have to do in a most, what we could have done in easy times, we'll have to do under a most forbidding and mm -hmm. troublous times. <laughs> the troublous times are here, brothers and sisters. I'm not trying to sell anything. Uh, but I want to say something at this point. We are going to continue on this theme throughout the week, and we're going to deal with Islam and Bible prophecy. And we have a, a book that uh, needs to be considered when it comes to Islam and Bible prophecy, because generally in the world, particularly in the secular world, but even in the religious world today, we teach that the Quran can be viewed as a, a book of peace, or it can be viewed as a book of war, depending on the mentality of the Muslim that's reading it. This book demonstrates that that is incorrect. The only way the Quran can be viewed is as a book of war. And you need to read this because it was written by a well-known Islamic scholar that taught at the premier university for Islam. And so when we're going to suggest as the week proceeds, that Islam is the third woe of Bible prophecy, and that it is bringing an escalating crisis upon the world that will produce the environment in the United States to bring the Sunday law and ultimately lead to all the cataclysmic end time events that we understand that are going to take place in Adventism. And we want to put into, into that argument the fact that when you look at the Quran correctly, you come to understand that what's going on in Islam today does not recede, it doesn't just remain the same, it's only going to escalate. Okay, and that's that's from their scholars. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that there was a prophecy fulfilled the 70 years of Jeremiah 2512 that marked the time of the end for the the next epic of sacred history, and that epic was to rebuild Jerusalem. And at that point there was an increase of knowledge about this upcoming history and the, the person that is used in the Bible to represent it, those that are running to and fro in this history was none other than Daniel the prophet. And that the person that understood from this prophetic message that it was, that the person that was used to formalize the message was Cyrus. Cyrus understood from the prophecy that it was time to rebuild Jerusalem. And Cyrus participated in this work by passing the first decree, but he, his decree was only empowered when Michael in Daniel 10 came down and empowered it, just as Michael or the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down and empowered Miller's message. Um, in the time period of the first angel's message of William Miller, the, the foundations of Adventism were laid, just as the foundations of the temple were laid in the first decree. The second way mark in the Millerite history identifies the activities of the enemies as the Protestant churches close the doors, paralleling the activities of the enemies of this history that it falls Smyrna to pass a decree to stop the work. And the second decree comes. Um, there is no illustration that I would recognize in this history of the manifestation of the power of God that is identified in the midnight cry, but you do not need that. You do not need that. You need the testimony of two or three, so when you bring all these lines of prophecy together, when you see the manifestation of the power of God in two or three lines, it's assumed to be there in all of them. And that's how we have always understood it as Seventh-day Adventists, whether you've thought about it or not. All of us as Seventh-day Adventists know that the kingdoms of Bible prophecy in Daniel 2 begin with Babylon, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. The kingdoms of Bible prophecy in Daniel 7 are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. The kingdoms of Bible prophecy in Daniel 8 are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, but in Daniel chapter 8, they don't mention Babylon. They begin with the Medes and the Persians. But it doesn't have to mention Babylon, because it's already been mentioned twice and established. So when it comes to lines of Bible prophecy, which is what Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 11 are, if a characteristic, if a way mark, is identified two or three times, it is established. The midnight cry is a component of the second angel's message, the second message, you will see a manifestation of the power of God. It is not here illustrated in the second decree. The third decree marks, is marked by judgment. Judgment is returned to the Jews. Judgment begins in 1844. The disappointment of the Millerites is paralleled by the disappointment of Ezra. 
the work of understanding the Sabbath and carrying the third angel's message to the world, which is our work, um, and everything connected to it is paralleled by the Jews' work in finishing and rebuilding Jerusalem. We're in apostasy today. We have not finished the work, and we could have. We could have. Sister White says, the only thing the Lord's waiting for now is for the people of God to perfectly respect his character in their lives, and then he will come. Amen. That work hasn't been accomplished. If it hasn't been accomplished, we're in apostasy. And they, they quit doing the work when they were rebuilding Jerusalem. In the middle of this history, in the middle of this history, we have the history of Christ, which is a reformatory movement. And if you turn to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10 of Isaiah 7, it would be really good if we could spend about an hour on Isaiah 7, because Isaiah 7, the first nine verses, mark the beginning points of both 25-20 time prophecies. They do it with a time prophecy. You'll notice... In verse 8 of Isaiah 7, there's a time prophecy. Have you ever wondered what that time prophecy is? What it's all about? I did for years, and so, so we stumbled on the 2520. Um, it says, and within three, four, and five years shall Ephraim be broken. What's that time prophecy all about? That time prophecy marks the beginning of both 2520 time prophecies, but we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with verse 10. In verse 10, it says, Moreover, the Lord spake again to Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. There's a prophecy about the birth of Christ, and I'm suggesting that when that prophecy is fulfilled, you have a prophecy that's fulfilled, that for that reformatory history marks the time of the end. There is a prophecy that's fulfilled, the birth of Christ, that sheds light upon the upcoming epic of sacred history, and the upcoming history is the week where Christ is going to confirm the covenant with men for one week, and in the midst of the week he's going to be cut off. So when he's born, the fulfillment of the prophecy that marks the time of the end, we just read in Isaiah 7, there should be an increase of knowledge at this time period on the upcoming history, and we should see students of prophecy recognizing this increase of knowledge. So where do we see the students of prophecy at the birth of Christ understanding that it's time for the Messiah to appear? The wise men from the east, the shepherds on the hill, and... Simeon in the temple. There's an increase of knowledge that takes place as the wise men come to the leadership of the Jews and ask about um, where is this um, child that's born. There's an increase of knowledge. When Jesus is 12 years old, there's an increase of knowledge on the upcoming epic of sacred history, which is the history when Christ is going to walk upon the earth. Now you see what I mean by the time of the end, right? There is a prophecy fulfilled that marks the the beginning point for this reformatory history, there's an increase of knowledge upon the upcoming history. There are students of prophecy that understand this increasing knowledge, and ultimately, the Lord raises up someone to formalize the message. And who does Sister White compare William Moody with over and over again? John the Baptist is the one the Lord uses to formalize the message. And he begins to present his message. And as we already identified earlier, it was at the baptism of Christ that John the Baptist's message was empowered. And for those of you that were here last night, and we read the entire passage from early writings, page 259, Sister White says that those that did not receive the message of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teaching of Jesus. I'm not dealing with it now, but I want to put it into the record. When the divine symbol comes down, the message of that time is empowered, but at the same point in time, a testing process begins for God's people. The testing process begins in 1840 to 1844 for the Millerites. That's what she's talking about in early writings, page 259. The testing process begins at the first degree for the Jews. The Jews that didn't come out of Babylon were lost as God's people forever. They stayed in Babylon and they were lost. And when, when Christ was baptized and John the Baptist's message was empowered, what did Christ immediately do? 
He went into the wilderness to be tested. It's a testing process that begins. We're going to come back to that. I just want to take note of it here. And he was also empowered. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the Baptist message was empowered there too. Um, the, the activities of the enemies in this history is when the Sanhedrin chose that it was expedient for Christ to die rather than the whole nation perish. And in between this choice and the cross, where judgment takes place, because John the Baptist is the first way mark, the work of the Sanhedrin is the activities of the enemies, and the cross is where we see the judgment illustrated. And of course, at the cross, we have the disappointment of the disciples, Immediately after the cross, the parallels the disappointment of the Millerite, which the white uses over and over again. But in between the choice of the Sanhedrin, the activities of the enemy, that Christ should die rather than the whole nation perish, we have the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem, which was a mighty manifestation of the power of God, and it is the history that Sister White most often refers to to illustrate the midnight cry of 1844. It's a parallel history. It's a disappointment. There was a work given to the disciples at that time. Now, the thing to remember is, with this history here in the Millerites, the fourth angel's message down here, it's taking place in our time period, 160 some years later. Okay, This entire history of Adventism that begins in 1798 and ends down here in the fourth angel's message. It's a couple hundred years long, all right? But this same history has been paralleled in the history of Christ, and between the cross and the history of Christ, the third way mark, and the fourth way mark, which is Pentecost, you only have 50 days. Pentecost, 50 days after the cross. So within that 50 days, you're going to have to see the work illustrated and the apostasy illustrated. So. It's valid, but it may seem a little bit simplistic for you. The work for the disciples, which is put aside their differences in order to receive the Holy Spirit and take this message to the cross, did they do it? Did they do it? No, they didn't. First, first, they went fishing. And the Lord had to come tell them, I didn't call you to be fishers of fish, I called you to be fishers of men. And this event, although it's minor, is lining up with the apostasy. Now, I realize I'm, that apostasy is prophetic, too strong a word to apply to the disciples for going fishing. But prophetically, that way mark is marked at that point. And then comes Pentecost, which parallels the latter rain, and it's the history that Sister White most often uses to represent the history of the fourth angel's message. And it also parallels the work of Nehemiah, finishing the streets and the walls in troublous times. On the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. There is much more to say about these lines of prophecy. There are also at least, we're going to deal with, Lord willing, in the next presentation, at least two more reformatory movements, but we could deal with four. And we're going to build some information on this, and then we will bring them all together, Lord willing, and show you that this history here, that's always repeated in every reformatory movement, is repeated when the 144,000 are raised up. And I'll give you an easy one to see. This is something that we all know. We all know this one. I'm going to show you as to close so you can see how this does line up with the reformatory movement that's taking place among God's people today. Now, you know, I know some people. I, I, I even know, uh, I know a person even in this room that struggles over the idea that this can't possibly be correct because we're not recognizing people that are hearing these things, bringing their life into agreement with these truths. But I want to, want to point out something for you and for them, is that one of the reformatory movements that lines up with this absolutely airtight is the reformatory movement of Elijah. And one of the main teachings in Elijah is that he couldn't see that reformatory movement impacting anyone. He's not the only one this is having an influence on, and the Lord rebuked him and says, there's 7,000. So our human side isn't going to be able to determine whether this message is actually accomplishing what we think it should accomplish. We're going to have to strictly let the Holy Spirit guide us through the, the revelation of His Word and trust that it is having the impact that the Lord intends for it to have. 
we're going to put a few more lines on here, bring it to a conclusion where we show the time period that we're living. And what I'm saying is that Miller's message went through history for a period of time. He began preaching it in 1833. It was the message of the hour. It was the first angel's message. Our message is not the first angel's message. What's our message? The third. It's the third angel's message. The third angel's message began to go through history. It came into history in 1844. It's been going through history, but there came a point in time when Miller's message was empowered, right? And when Miller's message was empowered, an angel came down out of heaven and empowered it. When is it that the third angel's message is empowered? It's when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down out of heaven and the earth is lightened with its glory. One of the characteristics of this first way mark is worldwide. So with just knowing that, you can see from the fact that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins the third angel's message, you can get a glimpse that this reformatory movement very specifically outlined what takes place in the reformatory movement of the 144,000.